you're a fan of the Halo franchise, you might enjoy listening to the history and the making of one of your favorite video game series. But even if you are incredibly knowledgeable on a lot of the things that are out there about the development of the Halo games, it's still very likely there are a lot of things that you had no idea about. So let's take a look at some rare and unusual development facts that not too many people actually know about. One thing that we've always found interesting when it comes to the Halo franchise, specifically Halo Combat Evolved, is that during the development stages of what would become this brand new intellectual property, a lot of things that are now staples of the series were very much so subject to change during the development time, as maybe Bungie didn't realize the impact of what Halo would become. For instance, many fans already know that when Halo Combat Evolved was in development, a lot of inspiration was drawn from the Aliens franchise, specifically the design that would go into what the elites or the Sangheili would look like. What's really cool though is that the design had been overhauled multiple times, but in some promotional footage for the more modern version of Halo Combat Evolved, you can see that the elites actually wouldn't have that split jaw design that they are now known for and is kind of a staple feature of this species in the Halo universe. They actually had these regular mouths and jaws that just kind of moved up and down and looking back now are kind of goofy looking, but still kind of one of my favorite little obscure details from back in the earlier days of Halo. Now look at this, blink and you miss it moment, but the early version of the forward unto dawn is going to pass by on the screen. Let me know in the comments if you can spot it. Yes, that giant FUD is the placeholder that they use for forward unto dawn. In Halo 4, the opening level actually went through multiple changes throughout the development, and a lot of the various versions of this first level are accessible through the leaked alpha and beta builds of the game that showed up in developer kits that leaked online over time. One of the really interesting things is that in the the final cutscene of the first level where all the stuff is happening around the dawn, you can only imagine how much work went into designing this level and having geometry pieces work in tandem with a moving camera. So I think it's awesome whenever you look back at some of the earlier footage, and this is something we've talked about before, when the forward unto dawn just crashes in, but they hadn't designed the forward unto dawn just yet, so they made a placeholder that just F-U-D for forward unto dawn, and it just slams through and I think it's hilarious to look at. I love it when like these very unfinished and unpolished versions of Halo levels make their way online just to see the progress that's made over time in making these things possible. The Halo Combat Evolved level the library always gets a lot of hate for how repetitive the level overall is, but one thing is interesting, this level actually went through a ton of overhaul from what was originally planned for the level, and it actually was originally incredibly ambitious. Now, the biggest and easiest source to hear about what this level originally would have been like is actually when some of the Bungie employees who worked on Halo Combat Evolved back in the day got together to do an IGN reacts to Halo Combat Evolved speedrunning, and during that commentary, if you've watched, all the way through to the library section, there's a little bit of insight as to what the original idea of this level was, and it's really cool. Listen to this clip. It was a giant ball with this like cool corkscrewing like staircase that went all the way down, and the whole time you could see this giant pulsating index in the center, and then at the last minute, they just couldn't pull it off for perf, so they just had to wall off the whole stairwell. Uh, yeah. So you can't oh. see the big <laughs> yeah, chamber, yeah. you can't see the big index. Right. That was you have so no painful. idea where you are. But like, originally playing it was really cool because guys would be jumping from different levels and you're constantly working your way down. You could see that your objective the whole time. It was really awesome. Also on the topic of cut content from Halo Combat Evolved or original ideas, there was allegedly supposed to be a level that took place between the silent cartographer and assault on the control room. Though when Combat Evolved was in development, this in-between level was scrapped and instead we just kind of have the pelican just coming up out from here and dropping Master Chief off and we are in the snowy biome all of a sudden and you know what? It kind of worked out in the end. But still, it'd be really interesting if we knew more about this cut level. Also, did you know Halo 3 ODST almost didn't happen? There was some early contracts that were designed between Bungie and Microsoft, and Marty O'Donnell actually commented on a YouTube video elaborating a little bit on this whole thing. Essentially, Bungie had signed on for two games. There was like this Peter Jackson tie-in type game and a fourth main Halo game, which I think would end up being Halo Reach. Now, when the Peter Jackson movie game fell through, Halo Reach was still on target, and Bungie assumed they only had to make 
Halo Reach, but Microsoft still had the expectation that they would make a replacement game, so after some talks, Bungie agreed to make a Halo 3 DLC, and then Microsoft made the push to release ODST as a standalone type game rather than a DLC, and that is how ODST ended up actually becoming a game and one of my favorite games in the Halo franchise. A couple of years ago, we covered this Easter egg that was hidden away in the Halo Combat Evolved Alpha that went to be one of the longest standing Halo mysteries as this picture would remain on bitmaps in the game files, and finally, years later, modders discovered the secret room on the level boarding action. We did a video covering this story, which was pretty cool, but one thing that's really interesting is allegedly the contract developer that hid this easter egg in the game commented on our video and said that this mystery girl is now his wife. Kind of a wholesome story. Another interesting thing, we did this huge video on the level Skyline from Halo 4, and it said that this takes place on the 512th level. We did trigonometry to figure out the distance of objects and figuring out angles to calculate how high up off the ground we were, and we were nowhere near 512 floors. Some people suggested that there could be underground levels, but that doesn't make sense because they'd be called like sub-levels or basement levels or something like that. And we even figured out that the skybox out there was like an area in France. We sent Tepig to go and investigate, and there was no 512 floor building over there. There was an interesting building that we did calculate was likely the building where the picture that was used for the backdrop was taken from. But we finally got an answer to this mysterious 512 floor, but a employee at Certain Affinity actually commented in our video saying that the 512th floor thing is likely a reference to Certain Affinity offices located in Austin, Texas that has the area code of 512. In February of 2021, I guess on Twitter, I thought it'd be funny to post Halo facts you clearly didn't know. I mean, this series was gold. Look at this tweet here. But for one of the Halo facts you clearly didn't know, I tweeted out that all the Marines in Chief's escape pod probably died because Master Chief didn't buckle up his seats and bounced around like a ping pong ball inside of the crash pod causing all the marines to die. Then Jamie Greesimer himself replied to my tweet saying, unfortunately, they all died because exit animations were going to take too long. So if you ever wondered why these marines are dead, uh, looks like they died because they needed to kind of move on to other parts of the game to work on. Then Duquesne ended up asking why they couldn't just be standing outside after Master Chief woke up, and Jamie responded saying that they tried that, but they would slip and fall off that waterfall bridge halfway through the bridge, and it didn't fit the mood that they were trying to set, which is a very fair answer. I then asked if Master Chief being a deadly ping pong ball could still be in my headcanon. He clarified a little bit of lore for the Halo universe, saying that no harness designed for a human would have been able to restrain him better than his iron grip. But I always assumed that those guys died when the pod was exposed to vacuum. It clearly wasn't designed for landing on an object with no gravity well. But sure, if you prefer that visual. Heck yeah! This is now officially canon. Kind of. Another interesting thing that was kind of posted on social media was from Max Hoberman, who was really integral in the work for Halo 2 and Halo 3's matchmaking systems, and also is the head of certain affinity. He founded it. But he actually tweeted out a while back a lot of really interesting details to some of the UX overviews for Halo 3, and talked a bit about the matchmaking systems that Microsoft implored with the true skill system, essentially the same system that Microsoft Microsoft still uses today, they use True Skill 2, and Max Hoberman had never really been a fan of that and has gone into detail on different occasions why True Skill wasn't really a good fit for a matchmaking game like Halo. And I'm gonna have Luke kind of highlight some of the interesting lines here. Uh, so Luke, you're taking on the role of Max Hoberman here. You are the voice of him for the next minute of the video. Go ahead, Luke. Tell us what Max said. I had to use true skill in Halo 3, but I didn't want to. It wasn't aligned with my philosophy. In order to make it work, I had to alter the fundamentals of how true skill worked. At its core, what you are all calling the level 50 system was about grinding to acquire an accurate level over time, not about getting you there as quickly as possible. I didn't believe that perfectly balanced games were always the most fun. In fact, I felt they were often most stressful. This is the fundamental flaw in true skill. In the Halo reach beta, the DMR had an ammo capacity of 12 by 48, with 12 bullets in the magazine and 48 reserved ammo. By the time the game released, that was changed to 15 by 60. 
What's interesting though is when you start on the mission tip of the spear, you actually still have that original 12 by 48 since it wasn't updated for that specific level. Over in the game files for Halo 4, Spartan Ops, which was built off of Firefight, actually had these interesting drop pod animations found in the files that are interesting because it could have been how you would have entered in some of the battles in that game mode. And who knows, maybe this concept will be brought back if there ever actually is a Halo Battle Royale released one day into the future. Also throughout the development of multiple Halo titles, there's this really interesting Colosseum type building that's appeared in the development stages for Halo 3, Halo Reach, and Halo 4. It never appeared as something playable for players, but it has existed as a testing ground throughout multiple titles, and that's really interesting. Okay, some people might know this next one, but it's still really interesting and it's worth noting here. There were a lot of things that were cut out during Halo 2's development, like a first person scene when Master Chief flies onto Delta Halo in the drop pod, engineers, parts of Mombasa being flooded, and what is really cool is that a lot of those ideas did eventually make their way in the form of Halo 3 ODST, where we have the first person drop pod sequence, engineers, and a little bit of flooding section. During Halo 4's development, 343 Industries posted a frequently asked questions section and discussed the possibility of Halo 4 getting a multiplayer beta. Mind you, it didn't get a multiplayer beta, but their explanation as to why it didn't get it is kind of interesting to look at all these years later. On the page, they explicitly said, while we are testing Halo 4 code, gameplay, and systems at significant scale, to get excellent data, input, and feedback, we are focused on polishing and shipping our experience for the duration of the year, and splitting resources to manage and build a beta is not on our schedule. When it comes to Halo Infinite, there's always this big contentious issue that was talked about heavily during the pre-production days, where there was an article that released early on by Game Rant suggesting that Halo Infinite was working on a half a billion dollar budget. And to this day, people still quote this article when talking about Halo Infinite, saying, hey, this is a half a billion dollar game, 500 million dollars, and there's not enough content, or whatever people want to criticize about Halo Infinite. But then, there's a lot of people being like, hold on, hold on. Video games don't cost 500 million dollars. And a lot of articles didn't really go into detail onto how they came up with that number, other than just like leaks or whatever that they like compiled into information but there was never like an exact breakdown of numbers. Now apparently this source started from a podcast from an industry analyst who did work on other games not related to Halo and he heard this as a rumor during a game developer conference from back in 2019 and he reported that the game cost 500 million in 2019 without marketing so far which is interesting because there was another source released around the same time suggesting that Red Dead Redemption 2 another massive triple A game that was in development during some of the same time as Halo Infinite. Now this suggests Suggesting Red Dead Redemption 2 may have cost $600 million is interesting, but once again, there's a lot of people out there who just disagree with that number when it comes to how much Microsoft would have spent on Halo Infinite. So you know, the boys at Rocket Sloth decided, hey, let's try to run our own numbers and just see what we come up with. Now this is obviously subject to be way on or way off, but let's just think about this logically for a second. First of all, we have to realize Halo Infinite had a very long long development process for a AAA studio, and in general, overhead costs, the longer something takes, will continue to grow over time. Now sources claim that 343 Industries, prior to the recent layoffs, had originally up to 750 employees by 2021. Now, not saying every employee at 343 Industries makes $100,000 a year, so we're gonna base this off of like a slightly above average salary for an average amount of positions that are in a game studio, especially because of the cost of living in the Seattle area being extremely high, chances are salaries are going to kind of match higher than like a game studio in say Texas, for example. And there's definitely employees at 343 Industries who are making way beyond $100,000, like senior engineers or something like that. So just averaging that, if we took 750 employees and multiply that by $100,000 each a year, that would mean active development on Halo Infinite it would take about $75 million a year. This doesn't sound far off from probably what the industry standard is for a lot of big, massive AAA games. The big thing that kind of inflates the number for the overall budget of Halo Infinite is the amount of time the game took to actually release. 
Since the game was in development since late 2015 and carried over all the way into 2021, and of course ignoring all of the extra work that was done by 343 like for Halo Wars 2 and the Master Chief Collection, just keeping 343 Industries open from the time from Halo 5's release to the release of Halo Infinite would cost approximately $450 million just to keep the employees on board. This isn't accounting for like property, like facilities or anything else like that. So just that alone really does paint the picture that $500 million for a budget is not at all out of the realm of possibility and is likely not only an accurate prediction, but probably underestimating how much went into Halo Infinite. Because we also know if you watch the 25 minute long credits in Halo Infinite, there were a ton of other studios that were paid contracts to work as support studios for Halo Infinite beyond just 343 Industries, a lot of them. And those studios take a contract and have to pay their employees to work on the game as well. Mind you, we haven't accounted for marketing, which was a really big push that Microsoft did with Halo Infinite and a ton of other factors as well. If we take it a step further, all of the reports of contract employees that were being cycled through while possibly saving money and maybe not having to put them on a hundred thousand dollar salary for example also becomes very costly for companies as if they have to cycle through the contracting employees you're essentially losing time that the game could have been developed quicker by having to train new employees so the bigger the cost that Halo Infinite ended up going into may have actually ended up being a result of some of the shortcuts Microsoft tried to do to cut costs in other ways. In my opinion, those rumors of the game costing $500 million in 2019 are probably actually under the mark of how much Halo Infinite truly cost. I would think with that extra delay that they did, I wouldn't be surprised if numbers later came out saying the game costed closer to $750 million instead. Also, mind you, for every year that 343 Industries is not working on a brand new game and they're just working on Halo Infinite, like the year following the release, get bringing things back up to stand and making content for Halo Infinite that was probably supposed to be done before the release could also kind of be accounted for part of Halo Infinite's budget because they're not working on a future title. So an extra year and an extra 750 or now less employees getting paid a salary does kind of impact things as well. I think the ultimate takeaway here is whether you're a fan of Halo Infinite or 343 Industries or you are not a fan of them, this goes to show that leadership is probably incredibly important and planning is incredibly important because even if Microsoft has bottomless wallets and they can just throw as much money as they want at something, it doesn't necessarily make it a complete and good game no matter how much they're willing to spend. I think Microsoft has a reputation over the years of kind of fumbling the ball with a lot of their studios that they have under them. I mean, Sea of Thieves took forever to really get into a healthier state and they still haven't fully fixed hit detection yet all these years later. Perfect Dark's going through the same exact thing right now that Halo Infinite seemingly went through. And there's just always a lot going on. During the promotional period for Halo 3 ODST, at the very end of the initial reveal trailer, there is this screen that pops up, alluding to the side story that you can find through the audio logs in ODST. However, you'll notice that the superintendent is searching for a character known as Maddie, and in the final release of ODST, the character was Sadie. However, after this trailer release, there was some people who were a little bit confused by this ending, thinking that this was actually a real world and heavily publicized missing person Madeline McCann. In 2007, while Maddie and her family were traveling on vacation in Portugal, Maddie at the age of three disappeared from her bed in the middle of the night, and sadly, Maddie was never found. Though there had been a ton of investigations and reports to this day, the family is sadly still looking for answers. And in 2020, after being missing for 15 years and 10 months, authorities have stated that she is presumed dead in absentia. Though many of the departments investigating this missing person will continue to treat this case as a missing persons case and won't give up until justice is served. But one of the big takeaways about this sad story is a lot of criticisms directed at the press and the massive coverage that this story got. As with the heavy coverage with the story, the family of Maddie were actually harassed quite a bit and is one of the biggest first instances of mass false information being spread on Twitter and also a lot of conspiracy theories spread by tabloid press. So cycling back over to Halo 3 ODST, when there was this confusion drawn with Halo 3 ODST's reveal trailer being just shortly after 
after this event happened in the real world, it's really no massive surprise that by the time the game actually released, Bungie and Microsoft decided to change the character's name to Sadie and rework the story into the game as they didn't want any real world connections to this tragic event being associated with Halo. And of course, just in the rare case that anyone out there might have any information that could help investigators find Madeline, her family hasn't given up yet. We'll put a link in the description to their website down below. Here's another really interesting thing. When it comes to development and behind the scenes things related to Halo, a lot of the times when a brand new Halo game would release, in some ways or another, the Halo game would feel completely new and unique when compared to a previous Halo title. I mean, sure, games like Halo 3 ODST, it is very clearly a fork from Halo 3, but when you compare things like Halo Combat Evolved to Halo 2, the games do feel very foreign, and if you didn't know that they were explicitly all built off of the same engine initially, you wouldn't recognize that there were similarities carried over from each Halo game necessarily. So when we do find little things that were carried over from previous games that still exist in later titles, it can be really interesting to look at. One thing that we found really interesting was that after Halo Combat Evolved, typically speaking, there were unique death animations added in for each Halo game beyond that point for enemies. However, in Halo 3 ODST, if you overload the map by spawning in a bunch of grenades and have a bunch of explosions happen at the same time, you can trigger this weird glitch to happen with these elites, and the elites standing and then free falling collapsing is the Halo engine skipping the typical death animation you would see, reverting back to the death mechanics that were in Halo Combat Evolved all the way back in 2001. It's especially interesting to see some elements of Combat Evolved still baked in there all the way later in Halo 3 ODST, and when Halo Infinite was in development and there was a bunch of trouble with development and all of these interesting news outlets were reporting on it, it seems like there are still some tools that are kind of baked into that Blam engine that sometimes cause trouble even nowadays because Halo's had a consistent engine for the last 20 years. But still, it makes little nuanced things like this really interesting. Halo 3 definitely feels very detached from Halo 2 engine-wise since the graphics had a huge overhaul, all of the weapons and animations were updated. However, an interesting thing that recently happened was a leak of an earlier alpha build of Halo 3 leaked online known as the Pimps at Sea build. The name there has a whole nother long story behind it. But one thing that's really interesting is that if you play on it and you take a look at the elites, at this point in the build, the elites were still using the original Halo 2 version of these guys before the updated design that would be later introduced for Halo 3. I don't know, as a younger fan, Halo 2 and 3 always felt so distant to each other in some way as far as like how the games felt. So seeing these little bridge connections are really cool. During Halo Reach's development, if you look back at like behind the scenes footage for the development of Halo Reach, a lot of times you can see Halo 3 assets being used in the earliest stages of Reach. And these games had very drastically different art styles and just general feel to the game. Halo 4 was built off of Halo Reach's engine by 343 Industries, and this one's a little bit more clear as there's a lot more similarities and leftover assets from Reach found in Halo 4. Right away, one of the biggest and easiest ways to tell is if you look at Halo 4's Forge mode, scroll through the menus, a lot of the items and categories are placed in the exact same order, and a lot of the little Forge mechanics kind of work in the same way that they did in Reach with some different changes. This is also the case in Halo 2 Anniversary, where the menu system once again for Forge mode is almost identical to that of Halo Reach, just kind of meaning that they carried on a lot of the core base for Forge throughout these three titles. In various parts of Halo 4, you can actually see some reflection textures, and if you take a closer look at them, you can actually see it's a sky view of the Halo 3 level Savo Highway, meaning this is probably an asset that's just been carried over all the way since the Halo 3 days. Now, Halo Infinite has a lot of similarities to certain things that are found in Halo 5, but one thing I thought was really interesting early on, all the way back in the beta phase where we all got to play the multiplayer test thing that they did, the flight, that's what they called it. Every once in a while, it seems like if a death animation got skipped for some reason, it would revert back to a death animation that was used all the way back in the Halo Reach days. But it's still cool to see that somewhere in there, Reach still lives on as like a core foundation block for where Halo has been built off of, eh, for better or worse. Now, if in general, the way that Halo engines have worked over the years and how one title would be carried over or brought back later on in some way or another interests you, there was a really cool Halopedia document following all of the Halo engine and forks that it has gone through over the years. It's incredibly impressive and you can actually learn a lot just from looking at this diagram about how Halo has evolved and what aspects have been brought back in one way or another. Like one thing I always found interesting, which we've talked about before in a video, is that at Halo 3, 
Bungie split off the engine into three different distinct forks. One fork would go on to become Halo 3 ODST, and that specific fork would then again be brought back way later on to be the basis for Halo Online, that cancelled Russia-only free-to-play Halo game. Since ODST still had those older Halo 3 era graphics, but a better lighting system in it, it's likely why they chose to use that, since the game was supposed to be accessible for not-so-great hardware. And it's also probably why 343 can't just snap a finger and easily backport things from Halo Online back into Halo 3 and MCC, just because this was technically a fork from ODST and probably takes a little bit of work to actually update the systems so that they could be compatible. That's why we've only seen a handful of maps brought over so far. The other two forks that we've known about are the Halo Reach fork, obviously, which would then go on to be the main fork 343 would use for the future of Halo, where Halo 4 would be built, Halo 5, and Halo Infinite, but also for a little while after Halo Reach's release, Bungie used this Reach fork for prototyping while they finished up on that third fork we mentioned a minute ago, which would become Destiny 1 and would continue to be upgraded over the years and is the main engine that is used over at Bungie for Destiny 2. We did a whole entire video breaking down this lost Destiny build that was built in Halo Reach and also talked a little bit about the connections to Halo 3, so if you've ever been interested in how that worked and what raids built in Halo would have looked like, it's a really fascinating video, so make sure you check that out too. But yeah, uh, what else is on this list? Oh yeah, the original Halo 2 was forked for Halo 2 Vista, which was ported by Hired Gun, which is interesting because Halo 2 Vista missed out on some of the specific things that are exclusive to the Xbox release, and then Halo 2 Vista would be the version that was used in Master Chief Collection later on. And then later on after that, 343 would make an effort to restore the differences in MCC from that version to the original Xbox version. So in a way, the MCC version of Halo 2 is essentially a big mod to make Halo 2 play and feel like the original Halo 2. See Sword Flying for a specific example where they weren't able to recreate the glitch specifically, so they had to write a new system in place so that the glitch could work as a feature, so technically it was no longer a glitch by MCC times. Oh yeah, and then the anniversary graphics was a separate engine on top of Halo 2, which would render the graphics in the newer way. And then on top of that, there were the animated cutscenes, which ran separately on top of that. And you can even, with some modding, remove the animated cutscenes and see the anniversary cutscenes running there. So there's like three layers stacked up that make up Halo 2 anniversary. There's a couple other notable things you can see on here, such as some cancelled titles or a prototype from the game Shadowrun, which was built using the Blam engine that was Combat Evolves fork. Stubbs the Zombie, I think, is the only other title besides Halo or Destiny to be used from this engine as well for a full release. So yeah, I totally love looking into the engine. I'd love to even know if there are direct connections between Combat Evolved and some of Bungie's older titles. There's speculation that that's the case, but we don't really know if there was ever just like a fresh start when Combat Evolved development began. If any super amazing Halo researcher knows the answer though, please do let us know in the comments. Here's another really interesting thing, especially if you're a Halo Wars fan. Ensemble Studios, the developer of Halo Wars, actually worked on a a new engine specifically for the RTS that would become Halo Wars, though at the time they were trying to make their own game altogether. And after the development and shipping of Age of Empire 3, which utilized a engine known as the Bang Engine, work on the Phoenix Engine would begin, which did retain some aspects of the Bang Engine, but this engine would end up being used for Halo Wars, which would release in 2009. But then it gets weirder. Right before the release of Halo Wars, Microsoft decided to go ahead and shut down Ensemble Studios, who of course were known for making the Age of Empire games and now Halo Wars, and instead a new company was formed by several former Ensemble employees who were familiar with Halo Wars and including the former CEO, but this time around the staff was only around 45 members, and they were put in charge of maintaining Halo Wars and making the DLC for it later on. This is what I think is really interesting though, is that Halo Wars 2 
2 didn't really enter development until 2015 and was led by Creative Assembly, who definitely had experience in the RTS category of games. However, despite Halo Wars 1 releasing all the way back in 2009, Creative Assembly ended up using that same Phoenix engine for Halo Wars 2, of course upgrading it for the release. This is based on the speculation, of course, that the engine itself has a lot of similarities as far as how internal files are structured and the naming mechanisms that are used. And we know there were probably upgrades made to the Halo Wars engine originally because of the remaster that came out, so it makes sense. But I never realized that Halo Wars 2, while being a more modern game, was still just based off of a game all the way from 2009. That was definitely a lot to unpack. Huge thank you to our patrons for supporting our channel financially. This is super, super helpful on bigger projects like this. We have to take a little bit of extra time to edit it and figure out everything we want to talk about. It's really nice to kind of have a little bit of a financial cushion, so if we have to really dive into something, we can. You guys have been super supportive to us since we launched this thing. We cannot thank you enough. If anyone else out there has a couple bucks they want to throw our way and support us, it goes a very long way, more than you actually think, because a couple people throwing $3 eventually ends up being $10, and then that's like monthly, and then it's like, hey, after five months, it's like 50 bucks right there, and that can help us, you know, hire someone to help us edit a part of a video or something like that. So thanks again so much. That's it for today. If you want to support us in a different way, make sure you guys stock up on your gamer subs. I've been drinking a lot of guacamole gamer fart and titty milk. So when you're stocking up, just use code rocket sloth. We get a little cut there and you get a discount as well. So that's kind of a win-win. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time with a brand new video.